Hey, Trails Collective, Ian here for the weekly rundown of the Northeast Trail Running World for the week ending September 24th, 2021. So I've got a pretty another full episode coming at you this week. Uh, we are going to kick off with a just a fun uh, story that came across my radar a month or so ago, and we will have an individual uh, regale us here uh, in a moment. Uh, we will have a, a handful of events that are about to cap out on the Ultra Sign Up Hot List, and then we have a number of uh, voices coming at you from events that ran this past weekend, uh, from the uh, marquee, uh, one of the marquee grinds, or one of the marquee hundred milers coming out of Virginia, uh, all the way up to the far uh, rugged and north uh, woods of the Whites in New Hampshire, and a handful in between. Uh, so uh, thanks to all those uh, in advance here who are uh, supporting the channel, uh, liking the uh, video, liking the channel, uh, following it. Uh, if you take the extra step to share it in your own uh, media profiles, uh, that would be most appreciated and awesome. Uh, if you share it on some other platforms, whether it be entities uh, like East Coast Trail and uh, Ultra or uh, Trail and Ultra entities like that, and just help us spread the word, that is awesome. Uh, thanks in advance to all of you who reach out with clips, uh, events that are going on in your neck of the woods, and to just stay connected. Uh, those who are on board as Patreon supporters, thank you very much. And to those who find your way over uh, on our site, which is trailscollective.com, to uh, the e-commerce uh, tab as well. Uh, we do have a shop, which is the uh, e-commerce uh, face of the Finger Lakes Running Company, where I'm filming at at the moment in Ithaca, New York. And we appreciate uh, if you do have uh, a uh, preferred, I guess, online source for your uh, running product, uh, and not dedicated to a local store of your own, uh, definitely uh, check us out and give us the opportunity. All right, so let's get into it. Uh, so more story time, the media, the Allegheny Trail Runners, RD, and volunteer for many events, uh, Ben Mazur cued me into a pretty wild occurrence uh, going down on the Rock the Knob course, Rock and the Knob course, as they prepped about a month back. Uh, here to take us into that fireside chat on a pretty ridiculous, uh, if not funny, situation is Wayne Glass. Uh, so Wayne, regale us with the occurrence of the Mountain Cadillac. Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Wayne Glass. Uh, I am here to tell the story of the Cadillac. Now, so on August 15th, we were training on the uh, 10K course at Rock the Knob. And um, it was myself, my wife, two other ladies whose uh, husbands usually train too, but they were out of town. And... I was on a harder part of the course than the females and they were, uh, they were hiking, doing their own thing. And I was climbing this, uh, terribly difficult, uh, part of the slope called throat punch hill that is super steep. It's like 40% grade. Um, and I get to the top and I make a right and I go a few feet down the trail and there, there's like a side skirt to, a, to a vehicle. I'm like, uh, I really don't know if a vehicle with side skirt should be on this trail. Um, for instance, just last summer, a friend of mine and I, myself, we had to uh, use a saw to uh, cut down some trees so his side by side could fit through there. So, uh, yeah, you know, registered vehicles meant for pavement, nah, not not so much. So I go a little farther, and uh, there's like the inner plastics to like the front fender well that keeps the mud from splashing up in your engine compartment. And uh, I make it around the next turn, and, and here come the ladies in my direction. Uh, they're, they're coming toward me, and they ask me if I see the car parts. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I see some car parts. I'm like, uh, somebody in Chevy Blazer must have got a little too rambunctious. And uh, they tell me, just, just wait, it gets a little better. So uh, we go around the next turn, and, and there's a headlight, a whole headlight assembly, like the whole glass and everything. It's, it's huge. And I, I still think, you know, SUV, definitely. Uh, and they kind of, they chuckle at me and we make it around the next bend and there is a Cadillac sedan, I think, I think it was two doors, it might have been four doors, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, not an SUV, a car, a nice car, a Cadillac, this was a nice car once, I mean, it's probably like 2012 or newer, um, black leather interior, you know, Cadillac, smashed right up against the tree. It's toast. It ain't going anywhere. Front right tire's gone. Uh, it's front right headlights back there, you know, somewhere. Uh, so, <laughs> we, 
we're, we, you know, they, they looked for, you know, a dead body in the car, couldn't find anything. Um, trunk and glove box are locked up. Uh, there was a nice backpack cooler type thing sitting on the front seat. Um, you know, soft things that you'd wear like a backpack, zip up, throw some beverages in. Uh, whoever was driving this car did not go continue down the trail or go the way they came. No, they took a straight right down over the bank. You could see where their heels were sliding in the dirt, then where they rolled and they mowed over saplings. Um, a path of destruction, you know, we, we have no idea who this is, why they're there. Um, they're at least two miles from pavement. So, you know, first thing is, you know, um, somebody might have a little too much to drink, was off-roading with their buddies, and, or a stolen car, you know, all sorts of ideas. So, uh, the ladies took pictures of license plate. Um, we got done with our hike and reconvened together and called the non-emergency number. One of the women did and, and reported it to the local police. And, uh, you know, they didn't say they were coming to talk, but one of them did show up before we left. And we were actually getting ready to go into Blue Knob Clubhouse to have some lunch. And the policeman showed up and he could tell by our smirks and we could tell, you know, he had to have been looking for us. So we chit chatted with him, told him the whole story. You know, first we think, oh, hey, the car is stolen. And he goes, well, I probably know who it belongs to. So he ran the license plate and turns out the license plate was registered to a Subaru. The Cadillac wasn't stolen. The same person owns the Cadillac. But instead of paying for two registrations, they just swapped their license plate back and forth from vehicle to vehicle, depending on which one they want to drive that day. Uh, so, you know, I guess uh, criminals, they just think in a whole different way. Uh, so he f starts to fill us in on, on parts of the story, which he actually witnessed. Uh, then later I came through, uh, you know, a friend sent me a link to a story on a news website and here's what happened the police tried to make a traffic stop on this vehicle in and around claysburg pa and the person driving decided to flee so they chased them through claysburg and up the side of this mountain to which the the guy driving a cadillac turned down a side road uh and lost the police at some point but he was a little bit under the influence of meth. So he was tweaked and paranoid. And even though the cops were done chasing him, nobody let him know that memo was not getting through. He just kept running. And like I said, his car was two miles from, from pavement. They had long since given up. But on his way down through the mountain, he's chucking his paraphernalia out the window. We, we found pipes and stuff along the trail. Uh, he gets down there, gets stuck gets out, runs down over the bank, crash, bang, boom, through the trees. And he ends up uh, crossing the creek at the bottom, which is sometimes like a river. It's, it's pretty wide in some parts. And soaking wet, he takes off all of his clothes because he's cold. It's early in the morning or something like that. Uh, and he ends up on this little, little, like out in front of this little old lady's house. And a passerby sees him and stops and, and tries to, you know, see if he needs help, uh, talk to him a little bit, but everything he's saying is gibberish. It's unintelligible. It makes no sense. The guy in the car realizes this guy is messed up. I should probably, I meant messed up. Uh, I should probably leave him alone. And so he drives up the road a little bit, but stops and watches and sees what happens. And the guy in his underwear crawls up onto this lady's porch. Um, you think of a, a door, a window and a window. Well, he takes a chair from this side of the porch and smashes out that window. And the little old lady's in this window. She's watching what happens. And as he crawls through that window, he, she opens up the door, comes out the front door, shuts it behind her, and, and walks over to where the passerby is. And they call the police. And when the police show up, he is barricaded himself in her basement. He, they can't get in. And they, like a Hollywood movie, they have to just bust down the basement door. And when they get inside, they find him laying in the corner, uh, soaking wet, 
covered in his own blood. And it's kind of like playing um, hide and seek with a five-year-old. He, he found a couple garments and put on his head and thought that if he can't see them, they can't see him and he's hidden. So uh, they see him. They're like, hey, man, you need to come out of there. And he says, I can't. Uh, I'm a bomb. And to which the state police are handling it like professional state police. And because they don't know the guy, but the local police, they know this guy. They just arrested him. The guy got out of jail on Thursday, and this is Monday morning. Uh, local police are like, okay, go ahead and blow up. We'll be outside waiting for you. And all the police officers go outside. They talk him out of there 20 minutes later, and they throw him in jail. And then after they do all the booking and whatever police stuff they got to do, uh, the state police are like, okay, we're going to go find the car. And the local guy goes, oh, good luck with that. Let me know how it goes. And that was Monday. And we discovered it Sunday. So, uh, it, you know, it's quite a story. And then it quickly became a little bit of folklore for the local race. And uh, somehow, I don't know how... Uh, a Cadillac only parking sign showed up right beside it. And, uh, you know, so throughout this whole thing, I'm kind of like Christopher Columbus. I didn't necessarily find the Cadillac first, but I'm getting a lot of credit for it. So, uh, it's been a hilarious story to tell. Um, unfortunately one Cadillac was harmed in the making of this story, but, uh, no human beings lives were lost. So, I find humor in it, even though I hope the guy gets himself straightened out. All right. So, good stuff. I really think that they need to uh, somehow incorporate that Cadillac into maybe the course proper. Uh, maybe run up and over it for bonus points or, I don't know, something to that effect. Ultra sign up hot list. Events that are about to cap out, if not already. The Mid-State Mid Massive Ultra's 100 miler running October 9th in New Ipswich, New Hampshire is 93% full. The Clark Six Hour Classic Six Hour in Jamesville, New York is 96% full. Uh, PA's Red Barn Challenge in Lycans, PA, uh, Six Hour, 12 Hour, 40, or 24 Hour rather, is 94% full. And the Western Maryland Rail Trail 10K, Half, and Marathons running October 17th in Hancock, Maryland are 91% full. Uh, so any interest in those, get on them now. All right, we've got a handful of FKTs, and then we are going to have are stoked to have a clip in from uh, an individual from one of uh, those. So let's start uh, state order alphabetical uh, main. Uh, Jesse Wall, six hours, 38 minutes for the 21 mile Wasatakoik Katahdin loop or something to that effect in Baxter State Park. Uh, gains over uh, 5,000 feet in route. Solid, uh, looks like a beautiful route. Uh, Barry Howe and one that I missed or wasn't posted last week yet. One day, five hours, six minutes for the men supported mark on the Burley 100 mile wilderness. It's a section of the AT uh, said, or uh, to some considered uh, the wildest section of the AT. Uh, so it does look pretty burly. I've not been up there, but it would uh, sounds pretty cool. Barry's time takes an hour off of Rob Erskine's mark from 2013. Massachusetts, Denise Klatt, one hour, 35 minutes for the 8.8 .8 mile Blue Heron Trail, which wraps the Cutler uh, Park Reservation through Needham, Dedham, West Roxbury, and Newton. Uh, Denise's is an opening unsupported women's mark. In New Jersey, frequent FKT flyer, Sarah Ports Connor, 51 minutes, 39 seconds for the 5.5 mile Sourland Mountain Loop. It's a route uh, wherein the description tags it as the best technical mountain running in central southern New Jersey. Uh, knowing Sarah has run quite a few places in the region, I'd love to know whether she concurs on best technical mountain running label. New York, another frequent FKT flyer. And thanks for joining us for uh, Red Nude Events. Uh, Kelly McDonald, one hour, 41 minutes for the Fulton Chain Trifecta. It's a 6.75 mile circuit covering Bald, Rocky, and Black Bear Mountains outside of Old Forge. And Kelly does an opening women's self-supported mark. And then a big one just came in a day or two ago. Um, Buffalo Area Trail Runner, Mark Valitas. Uh, 15 days, 12 hours, 10 minutes for a supported passage of the 595 mile Finger Lakes Trail end to end, an opening supported mark. Uh, it was one that uh, Mark gave me the heads up on when he was initially planning it and wanted to keep it low key uh, just to see how it went. And uh, I don't have his clip in yet, it's on the way. We will weave it in here. 
but um, he happened to be coming through the Finger Lakes trails at uh, just as my races of Virgil Crest Ultras were, were going on, which I think was, uh, it was pretty cool. So well played and timed Mark. All right, so queuing us into the end to end on the Finger Lakes Trail, 595 uh, mile journey. Uh, Mark, take us away. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Valetis. I'm a trail and ultra runner from just south of Buffalo, New York. Uh, I tend to like pretty remugged, rugged and remote trails. Uh, the guy behind the Buffalo Trail and Ultra Runners Instagram account as well. I hope you find some pretty pictures there. A lot of them tend to come from the Finger Lakes Trail. And I go by the trail name of Quad Father. Now, his big news here, I guess for me, is I just set the uh, overall slash supported FKT of the Finger Lakes Trail main branch. Uh, 15 days, 12 hours, and 10 minutes. Uh, trail changes uh, frequently for loss of access to private land, uh, reroutes, um, hunting closures, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, 584 miles tends to be the length that is quoted uh, when it's all said and done. I was pretty good at navigating, but ended up with about 595 miles total. That breaks down a bit over 37 miles and 6,000 feet of gain a day. If you're not familiar with the Finger Lakes Trail, the main branch runs east to west from the New York State Pennsylvania border in Allegheny State Park to Slide Mountain and Kikats Hills. It's a mix of public and private land, a little bit of road here and there. Uh, on top of that, there's branches that run north and south uh, off of those. Um, the conditions vary. Uh, you, you never know what you're going to get, how the maintainer, when they last hit the trail, the, just the underlying terrain, etc. cetera. Uh, if you, all you've done is Twisted Branch or Virgil, though, it's not what a lot of the trail is like. Uh, as for me and my ties to the FLT and the F Finger Lakes Trail Conference, I've been a maintainer on a section of the trail on map M3, just west of Little Rock City for a couple years now and a little bit further west prior to that. Uh, I write the trail running column for the quarterly Finger Lakes Trail News Magazine. Uh, and I'm starting to get involved with some of the mapping stuff there and you may have seen some of my photos in various places along the Finger Lakes Trail Conference. Um, prepping for this, I had already run uh, about 200 westernmost miles of the trail and out and back format. Uh, unfortunately for me, it goes a lot of the rougher stuff. I uh, visited Slide Mountain the, the day before Manitou's Revenge, actually, this year to get the Eastern stuff dialed a little bit. Uh, it, but it was tough to plan out what type of distances that I could not necessarily just do a day, but sustain. Uh, you know, 50K a day, yay, Rob, but after two weeks, can I maintain 50K? I, I don't know. Um, so, coupled with that, and then I not some of the crew early on, uh, I had to have fixed accommodations. They're not big campers. Um, it was challenging to lay this stuff out. I actually got a little bit ahead of what I had anticipated, but that was not a horrible problem to have early on. Some of the crew that I had were uh, familiar with crewing in general and the Finger Lakes Trail, that was convenient. But some hadn't crewed at all. They had no idea what to expect, where to find the trail, what shape I'd be in what to, uh, to, how to handle me. Um, they all did pretty well, actually, though. I was, I was very happy with how that all turned out. I was a little amusing, though. They, they learned to fear any road with the word old, a DC truck, tower, or hill in it. And there's lots of those. Uh, some of the challenges, or at least my worries and points, were the overlaps in crew. Uh, I tended to have one person um, continue through the night and then the next morning sometime during the day early afternoon they'd have to swap and I just couldn't coordinate that we didn't know where they'd be so that was on the crew and luckily they all nailed that some of the good stuff I found trail running heaven it's above uh, the Astelic River southeast Syracuse uh, I just come through an awful section of hail and rain it was cold and miserable and then the uh, weather broke and the sun came through in the golden hour and the Mist is raising off of it. Oh, I didn't want to come down out of there. Just absolutely incredible. Uh, I ran through the Virgil Crest races, like literally through the race by chance, just happened to fall on me coming through that area. Uh, in general, I bet I saw less than a dozen people the entire trail outside of Watkins Glen and some more populated areas. So it was so nice to run with other people. I hit two of the aid stations during the race. I owe Ian a half a pickle and two Oreos. Thank you, Ian. 
uh, it was a little weird cruising along though. And then I'd have to stop at registers to sign in when everyone else kept going. Uh, other good stuff, uh, body and mind held up pretty well for this. Uh, believe it or not, zero blisters, even though I had pretty wet feet for the majority of the tests. We'll get back to that in a minute. A little bit of chafing early on, but I kept on proactively and nothing there. Navigating, I think, was a big pro. Uh, I broke the GPX files from the FLTC and do stuff that was consumable on my Garmin Phoenix 6, and uh, it worked really well. But not so pretty stuff. I mentioned I had some wet feet, and that's uh, that's an understatement. Uh, there was only a single day where the, I just happened to hit some forest for where it fell on the day that I, I didn't have wet feet that entire day, but every other single day it was either pouring on me or you'd inevitably hit a farmer's field of just wet feet from the dew or, or within an hour. It, it just hours and hours every day of wet feet, no fun. Uh, day two, I stepped on a snake. I'm not real big on snakes. We each went our separate day, ways that day. There's a lot of rough trail out there, uh, a lot of overgrowth, thorns, just wading through that, standing water here and there. Um, it was That wasn't so fun. I mentioned I was hailed on earlier. I had a young kid throw a rock at me at one point. Uh, the, the watch navigation was good, but I did have two issues navigating. The first day went uh, further than expected early on. It would have been stupid not to get ahead a little bit. Uh, intended to go to the campground. We were camping that night, but failed to realize the campground wasn't on the trail, but on a spur trail off of the main trail. Uh, so there's a little bit extra and some panic involved with that. And I may or may not have been without a headlight as land. darkness was encroaching. Uh, the second day, uh, a course completed on my watch that I was paying much more attention to after the first day. But uh, I thought I screwed up the, the next course and continued on the trail. And I was following a trail that was a non-FLT trail on the FLT trail uh, map on my phone and just kept going and going and going. And before I realized what happened, dropped down off a mountain, up and over another one, down the other side. And then I realized what was happening and had to double back. So that, that probably cost me two hours and I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 feet a game by the time it was all said and done. Feet started to hurt four or five days in. Uh, no major deals. I still got some numbness in one of my big toes. Uh, hopefully it'll come back. The tends to do that after a couple of weeks. I've had this before after some hundreds. But uh, the, the most worrying some stuff was some sin issues. Couple of days prior to the finish, they started to get pretty sore. Two days out, they were getting a little worrisome, a little slow that day. And the last day, I was doing all right to start, but man, the one just started to hurt so bad. And then there were two very acute moments that I, I thought I might have done something bad, and I'd be limping in. And I limped on for probably a couple hours, but eventually got moving or somehow or another. And ended up being able to jog in at that point. And I was plenty happy with that. Still a little sore, a little swollen now, but no color. So hopefully nothing major, but I wouldn't be surprised if I did do something. Got to get a little bit of credit out. They say it takes a village. Um, I had probably had five or six different crew members that ended up getting engaged. Again, I was at a little bit ahead of what I anticipated. So some didn't even need to be used. But uh, John Gadude, without a doubt, my MVP crew member, he was along for the first week. Uh, he, I had him crew for me before, he's very expert, knows what the heck he's doing out there. So uh, the Catskills is where he was, communication was weak, we had established protocols. He it was unreal. Even after he was done, he continued to quarterback and he would help the other crew members. Um, he booked the hotels for me. Um, when we left the Catskills, he had my car. I didn't know it for how I would see it again, but not only did he get it back to me, it was washed and cleaned. He picked my mother up for the finish, and not only did he get her there, he got her flowers while he was at it, too. Unbelievable, John. Thank you so much. I'd also like to thank Christy Post. Uh, she's the Director of Marketing Communications for Finger Lakes Shell Conference. I reached out to her last year when her introductory article was in the FLT News, and we went and ran Little Rock City together and just have had a, a great time running stuff since. Uh, crewed and paced for her at Twisted Branch this year in those horrible conditions. And she did so well there. Uh, she had come out and sli uh, scouted Slide Mountain with me earlier. 
She's always been insightful for stuff along with the FLTC. She crewed two days for me and um, she was there when I finished my end to end well before the very end of this. Uh, and then she came back the very last day and was there for the finish of all this. Um, so very fortunate to have those folks there. I have nothing else on the docket now. I was supposed to run no business in, I don't know, a week or two. And I said, ah, that's probably not the best of some ideas. So I just dropped this morning. Uh, we'll see what next year brings. I have no set plans at this point. Uh, if any of you are interested in running the FLT, uh, various parts of it, I'm happy to give any out. Any suggestions, any feedback, uh, let me know. Uh, I can be reached probably the best way is via that Buffalo Trail and Honor Instant Buffalo Trail and Buffalo Trail and Ultra Runners Instagram account. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions and maybe we'll see you out on the trail one of these days. Thanks, guys. All right, so great job, Mark. That is quite impressive. I've had several friends that have talked about that journey. Uh, one that set off, uh, got an injury midway, and a couple others just haven't uh, made it happen. So great job in getting out there. All right, so let's move into some results and voices from the collective. In Connecticut, Forgotten Forest, it's a nine-hour event in the Roosevelt, Roosevelt Forest in Stratford, Connecticut. Ran its sixth, sixth edition. Got to say, the ultra sign-up event photo reminds me a little bit of a Blair Witch and creeps me out a bit. I'm not sure you're going to find me out on that course. Of the 43 finishers who, didn't, who, who it didn't creep out, uh, Laura Becker took the overall win with 50.601 miles covered. With the top fella on the day going to Tyler Pinot, losing the lean at 50.60 covered. Pennsylvania, Boulder Beast, 25K and 24 miler, a PA Trail Dogs event. Uh, PA Trail Dogs consistently probably turning out some of the highest uh, participation numbers uh, in our region. Uh, it ran in Lock Haven, PA. We have the Beast in at number nine in toughest trail marathons on the Trails Collective uh, ranking of Northeast Trail Races. Uh, brings in 5,300 feet of gain and 24.7 miles, some of it with a bit of technicality. And for results on the day of 272 finishers in the 24 miler, young gun Reagan McCoy took the overall win in 356. Nice work, Reagan. And with Lisa Fisher on top for the women in 505. Of 195, 190 finishers in the 25K, Jeremy Johnson emerged on top in 239 just under a minute below the prior course record to establish a new men's uh, course record and mark. Uh, first woman on the day went to, woman on the day, went to Katie Martin. I'm thankful for both women's winners, Lisa Fisher and Katie Martin, coming in with these clips on the Boulder Beast and their days out there. Uh, Lisa uh, will take us through some of the signature uh, Boulder Field, variable terrain, and most excellent community. Hi everybody, I'm Lisa Fisher. I'm from Kogan Station, Pennsylvania. I live in an area that happens to be surrounded by some of the best mountains with the greatest trails to train on. And with that comes some pretty amazing local races. One of my favorites being the Boulder Beast, which we just ran this last weekend. This race in particular is definitely defined by its name. Um, one of the unique qualities of this race that others do not have is the boulder field climb, which I think is pretty appealing to most people. I think the boulder field keeps people coming. Um, so you get to the bottom of the boulder field and you look up and it looks pretty intimidating. And then you start climbing and you are very much engaged the entire way because you need to be sure of your footing from the bottom to the top. Um, but once you reach the top, it's one of the most amazing views you will ever see. Now, it happened to be pretty foggy this last Saturday, so I didn't get a view at all, but um, I happen to live close enough so I can go climb it whenever I want. I have some pretty cool pictures from the top. Even if you're not a trail racer or runner, um, I would highly encourage you to get to the top of that. You can get there in other ways, too. You don't have to climb the boulders just to see the amazing view. Totally worth it. Um, what else can I say about this race? I think one of the coolest aspects is that it has all the things. It has some road portion, which is honestly the most challenging for me because it's not my favorite, but it's approximately three miles to the trailhead through the town of Castania. And then once you reach the trail, you know, you're, you're going through a stream right at the very beginning and then you're hitting some rocky descents that happen to be slippy on Saturday. So definitely need to be sure of your footing on those. 
you have your steep climbs throughout. I think I ended with 5,700 um, foot of elevation. And you have the boulder field climb in there. You have some tringle, single track that you can just grind out. So you have some pretty solid miles that you can just run. Um, and some of the best people, I would say. You know, um, I ran with somebody this last Saturday who was willing to chat for miles. Just happy, positive, um, great group of people to be around. I can't say enough about the people locally that run those aid stations in the races. Um, this one in particular, very, very positive, uplifting. It's just a great place to be and it's, um, it keeps you coming back. This is the third time that I've ran the race and I will definitely be back for more. Um, if you're up for the challenge, which a challenge it certainly is, I would highly encourage you try it. Uh, lots of other races locally. Um, they actually started a 25K too. So they didn't have that to start with years ago, but now there's two distances and you get to climb the boulder field no matter what. So you either have the 25K or the 25 miles. Um, both I would encourage you to try. Um, so all in all, it was a positive day. Um, I can't say there was anything negative about it. Just that, that pounding pavement to the end, those last three miles, I would say is for sure the worst mental game of the entire race, but I made it right. And Katie on your day out there nailing on the base, uh, nailing the base on a new baby stroller training, which you should probably market and get to coaching. Uh, Katie, cue us into your day. Hi, um, I'm Katie Martin. I just wanted to touch base after running the Boulder Beast 25K last weekend. Um, I'm the first female finisher. I'm playing the second year of the 25K, trying to um, do a lower distance option. Um, this is my first race back, or second race, I guess, after having a baby five months ago. Um, I ended up signing up for the Webster Trail Classic uh, Trails Rock event. Um, two weeks ago as my first race back and then I had this 25k as my second race back. I ended up having a bad wipeout two weeks ago on the Webster Trail Classic 10 miler. Um, wasn't sure if I was going to race this past weekend. I had a pretty good rib, rib injury but ended up feeling okay the night before the race so I went ahead with the race. Um, it was perfect weather. Uh, started out a little bit cloudy and foggy. Um, but it was a great race. I took it a little bit easier on the downhills, um, took it easier on the rocks so I didn't slip and have another injury to make my injuries worse. Um, but starting out on the road for three and a half miles and ending on the road really helped with shaving some time off on both ends. Um, so it was a little confusing starting out being combined with a 24 mile race. Um, so it started out pretty packed to start and then spread out, you know, once we um, separated distances and I ended up just going the 25k route at the 8 mile aid station um, and then I was really able to see that there really wasn't anyone around me. Um, I was able to speed up on the downhill after the boulder climb. Uh, the boulder field is an adventure climbing up all those boulders. We're not really used to that up in New York um, and I think the training Using the stroller with the baby up, doing some hill workouts helped with some of that. Um, I haven't been able to run quite as much since I had the baby five months ago. I took the, um, let's see, two months off after the baby and then got slowly back into it. And now I'm really only running probably two or three times a week, um, mainly stroller runs and then a long run or two on the weekends. Um, so I'm really getting right back into it slowly. I've the VIEW 25K in November coming up too, which again, I deferred from last spring when I was having the baby in April. I wasn't able to race the Heiner 50K last spring, so I'm still getting back into it. Um, but I'm looking forward to um, having another race in the fall and then hopefully one in the winter and getting back out there full speed next spring. Thank you. Another one that went down in PA, rocking the knob, uh, billed as PA's highest trail race. Uh, put on by Ben Mazur and the Allegheny Trail Runners, went down in Claysburg, PA. The 10K rated toughest uh, 10K in PA, according to our rankings. 
offering about 1,500 feet of climbing. Had 85 finishers with Steve Templin and Jane Hall Hallinan on top for the men and women. The half ranks in at number eight, toughest in the Northeast. Of 59 half marathon finishers, AJ Kelly and Stephanie Daniels were one and two overall for the top men and women, uh, respectively. And for the Big Mama, the marathon ranking in number seven, toughest in the Northeast, was 6,700 feet of gain. Of 57 finishers, Dave Endress and Jessica Simeo took the men's and women's uh, wins, respectively. And to weigh in on the event, King of the Allegheny and uh, men's fourth place finisher, Aaron Keckley, uh, weighing in on the series and getting owned by rocking the knob, whether you intend to or not. Hey, trail runners, this is Aaron Keckley from Sipesville, Pennsylvania. Just checking in with you and Ian on the Trail Runners Collective to give you an update on the Rock and the Knob Mountain Marathon and the King and Queen of the Allegheny series that I participated in this year. Uh, the King and Queen of the Allegheny series was the compilation of five trail races in this area, starting off with the Queen Mahoning Ultra and Relay, which I participated in on a solo uh, to do the 50K, um, coming in first place there uh, in less than a minute. Uh, right behind me was second place and I turned around he was right there. Uh, the second race uh, for the series was the Rothrock Trail Challenge, which I have an old school hat here um, for when I had run it a couple years ago. Great course, great race, definitely uh, recommend you all check it out. Uh, third race of the challenge was the Lost Turkey where I got lost and did some extra credit miles there. Uh, place in seventh on that one and um, then was the Allegheny Front trail race beautiful course in an area I hadn't really run much at all and uh, definitely worth checking out running again and then finally uh, the Roth Rock Trail um, marathon which interestingly enough was the first marathon I'd actually ever done um, I've always run stuff below or above that distance but this past weekend was the officially 26.2 for me, so I got to check that box. I'd have to say the races that they chose for that series were phenomenal. They had each, each and every single one of them had their own specific quirks about them that made them special um, and definitely worth checking out. Uh, I would have to say all the race directors give kudos to them and all the volunteers and the staff. They did a phenomenal job and we always appreciate our trail running community and the time it takes to uh, put on these events. Uh, but just a little bit uh, at the end here about the, the mountain marathon. Um, brutal is the first word that comes to mind. They warned me over and over again, it was my first time running the event, that um, it was going to be going to be a tough race, and for sure it was. Beautiful day. Uh, the weather was, you couldn't ask for better weather. I know last year I think it rained the whole time. Um, but uh, went out pretty easy. I let the lead group go out and be rabbits and... Uh, I was hoping that they would uh, kind of burn themselves out. Um, I ended up catching the lead pack right around mile 13 or so, and that's when we started hitting a lot of the, the, the big climbing section of the race, um, where I backed off and tried to save my legs. Little did I know that th there wasn't really much you could do to save your legs. That the, the Roth Rock Mountain Marathon is gonna is gonna own you no matter what. So um, the most Iconic, I would say, part of the race for me was the uh, not only the the ski slope we had to go up, which was pretty much a hands and knees type of type of climb, but also I think they went took a page out of the Barkley a little bit when they decided to go straight up the mountain, bushwhacking and hanging onto trees, um, which was definitely a a trail that was definitely an interesting part of the trail as well, as well as that random Cadillac that somebody decided to dump in the woods for no apparent reason. They might have been stolen, I don't know, but uh, that was definitely the strangest thing I'd seen out on a race course before. But um, again, just thank you for everybody who hosted the events. I want to throw a shout out to the Queen of the Alleghenies and uh, kudos to her. Good job well done. You're an inspiration to all of us and um, I look forward to next year's series. I'm not quite 100% sure if I'm going to participate in the series, but I do intend on talking to the race directors and um, handing the crown over to the next one who decides to take 
the reign as king of the Alleghenies. So whoever you are, um, hopefully that fires up a dream for you. Go for it. And um, the sky is the limit. I pretty much, I dedicated the whole year for the series and I cleared my racing schedule to only include all those races and then half the battle is just showing up. So do the hard work and I look forward to next year as they might add more races and um, just seeing who all wants to get out there and compete. So again, um, thank you all. I really love the trail running community. Um, I tend to be a solo runner and don't really have people I run with very often, but when it comes to race day, it's just a, it's just a joy to be around you all. So happy trails. And top women on the day, uh, Jessica Sameo on begging for the hills to flip and winding us through an honest, tough course. Uh, Jessica, take it. Hi, I'm Jessica Sameo, and I ran the Rock in the Knob Mountain Marathon this past weekend in South Central Pennsylvania. Um, it's put on by the Allegheny Trail Runners, and it's billed as the highest uh, trail race in Pennsylvania. So there's actually three distances. There's the marathon, uh, a half marathon, and a 10K. So the marathon's got about um, over 6,500 6, feet of gain. The half marathon, I believe, has over 3,500 feet of gain, and the 10K has over 1,500 feet of gain. So it's a, you know, we get a lot of climbing for your money there. Um, it was really just a beautiful day. All of the volunteers were fantastic. Really just a nice, chill vibe, um, and really just a fun race overall. So. Um, for, you know, I ran the marathon race and that the first seven miles of that race until the first aid station are very relaxed. They're very chill. Um, you know, nice single track mix. Um, there's one steep descent that they call the blister blaster. And that was one of my favorite parts of the, the race is there's, they name all of their, their big major hills. It's just really fun. Um, so, you know, I tried to take that, um, you know, just enjoy those downhills until I came into that first aid station. And really the climbing doesn't start until around mile 10. Um, and there's, that's where you start your first, uh, you know, s slow kind of steady climb. Um, it's got some breaks in it. And I just tried to go real conservative for those, those miles there. Um, and then around mile 14, you actually join up with some of the half marathoners. That was really fun because um, I had a friend that was running the half marathon race and so I was kind of looking out for her as we were kind of running along with those runners as well. So, um, and you know, when you're, you're running that, when you're running with an, another race of people, you don't really know who you're racing. So it made it, you know, just that more interesting. And um, I really enjoyed being able to talk to all the different people. Um, so then around um, mile 16 into 17, um, you run down into what's called Beaver Dam Canyon. Um, and then it's a kind of a slow, steady climb out of um, that beaver dam run. So it's, you know, just what I consider classic Pennsylvania, um, you know, trail where it's millions of rocks, you know, all of them are wet and mossy and most of them are moving. Um, plenty of nettles all around, but, you know, um, got to chat with some people as we we're making our way up that climb. And it was, you know, it was a, it was a good time. And then once you get um, past that, there's some some pretty easy running um, until you get to um, the hairpin aid station, and that's where you're um, very close to the top of the ski slope. So you know, all the while, so we're at this point now, like you know, 17 miles into the race, and you know, you still have all these big climbs left. Um, so when you get to the top of that ski slope, it's just really beautiful views, and you're running down um, the ski slope. I, I believe it's Upper Mambo um ski slope and you're you're running down um you know it's it's pretty steep um and some of the rocks were kind of loose so you had to watch your footing um and i had known from a friend that they had added uh a new hill that they called urus which is i believe the the god of east the east wind um and it said that um you know they were kind of advertising it as you know that it seeks out the unworthy and plucks them from the earth so you know i knew this this big climb was coming around mile 18. um so you know as you're running down the ski slope it just it keeps turning and you keep going down and down and down and then you finally um you see where there's that sharp turn and you're going right up that hill again i think it's a 40 percent grade it's not that long it's only about a quarter mile but it, it's very steep 
And uh, luckily, you know, by that point of the day, it was starting to get warm. Um, luckily, there was a little sliver of um, shade that I was able to kind of hang into um, and kind of try to stay cool. Um, so, you know, you had just gone from really, you know, steep downhill running to that steep uphill again. And then um, you get that like a really short little recovery before going to another steep downhill. So I remember thinking to myself, wow, it's just <laughs> it's funny, a race that really makes you um, you know, you're running so steeply downhill that you're begging for an uphill and then it, it switches right to an uphill and then you're begging for the downhill again. It really just keeps you on your toes. So that made it fun, you know, and after that, that climb, I was starting to feel the cramping coming in. Um, just, I think from the, the changes from all the up and down hills again. So after that short, again, very steep downhill, then you make a sharp turn up what it's called. I need a Sherpa hill again just very clever and fun um it was really just um not really a trail so much as just it looks like the steepest way to get from point a to point b just this like really kind of loose rock and dirt that uh, you know really what i needed was poles not a sherpa um i just felt like i was clawing my way up that mountain and again it's, it's a short climb but it's just it's so steep and um it, it reminded me if anyone ever ran um you know frozen snot just kind of those those um, really steep climbs where there's a lot of little saplings around. So it's just kind of tough footing. So you get to the top of that and um, it kind of evens out. There's again, some more climbs, but then you, you go back um, towards the finish basically. So that's where the ha half marathoners are finishing. But for the marathon, there's um, what they call the quitters row aid station. And it, I could really feel, I can understand why people might want to quit at that point because you're you really feeling beat up. Um, I got some ice in. Um, just to stay cool, put it in my hat. And then, um, so then it's about a 10 K until the finish. So you, you go out on like a three mile, um, stretch, which is a really nice, very gentle single track, um, to get to the last aid station. So, um, very nice, easy running, nice to recover at that point. And then eventually like, um, you know, after two miles or so you start to go kind of on a steady, um, but wide grassy downhill. So very easy footing, easy to run, but you know, the more you're running downhill, you're like, Oh, I know I'm going to be coming back up this. And, um, that downhill is kind of known as the devil's hairpin. So when you get to the bottom of it, that's where your last aid station is. And so they were really great there too. Um, getting me fueled up, cooled off before that, the last two big climbs. So the first one's called throat punch. So that's kind of like the, um, kind of like the humble hill of this race, you know, for those who know Heiner. Um, again, very steep um, ascent up, but because I had just done the aid station, felt revived and everything. So that was great. Um, and then you, you kind of, um, the trail evens out a bit. You go through um, some pretty flat, easy running um, through something called Cadillac Alley. And there's there's a Cadillac car just stuck in the middle of the trail, which was fun. I don't know how it got there. Um, and then you go up what they call Soul Sucker Slope. So it's kind of three smaller hills, but it's a, I believe it's around a mile of just um, kind of just steady uphill. Luckily, it was mostly um, logging roads, so it was very, fairly easy footing. So you could kind of just put your head down and, and climb up that hill. Um, and then once you got to the top, there's some just nice single track to the finish. Um, overall, awesome race, highly recommend it. Um, again, I just love that there are the three different distances. So, you know, if you have a, a friend out there that's, you know, maybe not wanting to do the longer distance, you know, you could easily convince them to make poor choices and, and sign up for the 10K or the, the half. And it's a really great family friendly atmosphere with lots of people, um, you know, hanging around out around the finish. Um, you know, it's right at Blue Knob Resort, so there's plenty of lodging in the area. There's also um, a campground and state park that's nearby. So, um, and again, the Allegheny Trail Runners, they did an amazing job. The trails were beautiful. I can't say enough about it. All right, thanks. All right, so nice work all out there. Uh, moving up to New Hampshire, Kismet Cliffs Half Marathon Little Beast 5 Miler put on by Tom Hooper and the crew at 603 is one of my top bucket list races. Uh, I was scheduled to race uh, this year and was really looking forward to it, uh, but sometimes life gets in the way and that didn't quite pan out. Uh, of 121 finishers in the half, uh, Joseph Carpenter took the win in 227 with first woman and second overall going to Corey Dow, uh, who came in at 230.54, 55 seconds off of the money mark. 
The 48 finishers in the five miler, Nicholas Ring took the overall win in 52-11 with top women's mark going to Ada Chapman in 59-32. And here to take us into our kismet on sending a bit out of your comfort zone, the mountains, and almost the money, women's winner, Corey Dow. Hi, I'm Corey Dow. I'm a runner in the Mount Washington Valley. I'm here today to talk about the Kismet Cliff Run, Beast of the East, uh, repping the super cool trucker hat that they gave us this weekend. I'm always excited about a trucker hat. Uh, super New Hampshire. I love New Hampshire. Speaking of, New Hampshire State Tree, the white birch, my favorite. Um, Part of what I love about New Hampshire is all of the mountains, so I do a lot of mountain running and road racing in the area. Uh, the Kismet Cliff Run wasn't one that I've typically considered because it's a bit further than I'm used to. A half marathon is, is further than I like. Um, I'm weird. I love racing, but I don't always love running, especially by myself. Um, the Kismet Cliff Run. I also don't like talking about myself, so this is rough. Um, the Kismet Cliff Run, one of my friends was is, was planning on doing it. I also had another good friend who raced it last year and she did really well. She won it for the women. Um, and my friend was, yeah, my friend who was doing it this year was really excited for it. He's been pumped about it and people have been trying to get me to do it. And what really sealed the deal sort of, even though it still took me took some consideration was the cash money that was offered this year for breaking 230 for females, uh, which I didn't do, <laughs> but I was, I was pretty close, I guess. Um, it was really still a, an awesome experience. Uh, I've done some other mountain races in the past, like Waterloo Valley, Cranmore. I really love doing them, uh, but this race was a little different just largely because of the distance. The things that I was most nervous about going into it were fueling for the race because I'm not used to running that far. So, uh, and I can't have gluten or dairy anymore. So uh, last time I ran that, anything that was that distance was last summer doing the Prezi. Um, I had like a untapped powder thing that I could put in my water which is end, ended up being all I needed, but I had some other little snacky items, but I was nervous about that. So I was a little cautious pace wise. And then uh, the distance was the other piece, just running that hard for that long over hills and mountains, hills, mountains, cliffs, um, dirt roots, all the fun stuff. Um, but we made it. Uh, so yeah, my friend said I could do it. My friends believed in me. I believe in myself. I still know I can break 2.30. Um, so I'll do it again next year, I suppose. Uh, talking a little bit about the race. It... <laughs> I keep looking away. Um, the race started out actually pretty pretty decent pace. My friend and another guy like took it out. And it has a nice start, kind of flat uphill ish and then you start then you just go right up all of a sudden you're like oh man my legs are are working to go up cathedral and it's kind of nice though because you go up and down there's some flat sections like there's good areas where you can make up for the fact that maybe you haven't done mountains in a while like a few weeks me or um if you're not as good at the downhill or something which some people are a little nervous about um especially this going into this race we were really warned about like how wet or slippery the downhill off north moat was um i'm going all over the place this is how my mind works so cathedral we went over to white horse um you go down then back up pretty steep again then you got a nice downhill and then all and then you're rolling into north north moat um up red ridge i've run all these Mount, I've run the North Moat and Whitehorse and Cathedral before, but I hadn't gone up, I hadn't gone up Red Ridge. Um, it was actually, I kind of liked it going that way. I didn't think I would, um, but it takes you up through, I don't know, it's just, you're up, it's techy. You're sometimes like literally climbing up a rock wall sort of deal. Um, but it, it goes by kind of quick, I think. 
the whole race in general. Um, once we got to the top of North Moat, the most techy and like the hardest part, I suppose, that some maybe some people would say would be like going down North Moat because you have to be careful. Um, that was one thing. I haven't found a trail shoe that I love. Um, and so I, I had to be kind of careful with the ones I was using because the tread isn't great. Um, but the shoe's awesome. The New Balance Summits, they don't make them anymore. Shout out to New Balance. Please make them again. Um, but going across, after, after you go down that techie part, it's pretty smooth sailing. You really got to work that end part. Um, I actually thought I was in a good place for the 230 barrier, but the last two miles is like downhill, but really twisty turny. So you can't really go fast coming off of Whitehorse because there's so many turns and things and roots. And even if you can blast Rudy downhills, it's just hard to run a fast time. Um, so <laughs> that's my recap of the race. So terrible. Um, the race was awesome. Uh, a lot of fun, really good people out there. It was cool to see some people just like randomly out in on North Moat and things, cheering people on. Um, and yeah, I hope people give it a shot. Some We need more people there next year. Races have been a little uh, dull this year. Not a lot of, not as many people out there. Just I think because of, you know, it's crazy times we're in. Um, so yeah, awesome job to everyone who was out there. Another one that went down in Kilkenny, or in New Hampshire rather, Kilkenny Ridge Race. Uh, I was signed up for these back to back. I was gonna try to do Kilkenny on Saturday and Kismet on Sunday. Uh, but I started coaching uh, this season and it uh, just wasn't uh, in the cards. We had to meet that day, uh, which I am really enjoying doing, but it would have been cool to also be running up in New Hampshire. Uh, a trip through the rugged White Mountains North Woods region is where Kilkenny takes uh, entrance. Uh, dense foliage, slick and technical footing, and over 15,000 feet of elevation gain have this in as my number two toughest 50 mile in the Northeast uh, behind Manitou's Revenge. Uh, here to give us a more visceral feel for Kilkenny is Nicole Yoakum, uh, barely missing a new women's course record, but extending an amazing year, crushing some of the toughest mountain ultras in the Northeast. Uh, Nicole, you're awesome. Take us deeper into Kilkenny. Um, I'm reporting on my experience running Kilkenny Ridge Race in the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire this past weekend. I did the 50 mile. They also have a 25 mile option. Basically, um, for the 25 mile, you take a shuttle um, to the starting line and then you come back to South Pond Recreation Area, which is where the 50 mile begins. So it's an out and back, um, if that makes sense. Um, it's a pretty gnarly race. It had uh, 15,000 feet of gain for the 50 mile, and then the 25 has exactly half of that. Um, so basically you're summiting, I think it's Mount Mount Cabot and maybe Wampek, something with a W, um, and, and some other uh, smaller mountains. But those are the two 4,000 footers um, in the race. Super rocky, super tough terrain. I haven't done a lot of hiking or running in the whites uh, personally, I had never been on any of those trails before, so I was definitely in for a treat. Um, the conditions were pretty, pretty tough. Um, part of the race was was nice weather, but um, there were good, sub, there were substantial uh, portions of the course that were really muddy, and then it also rained for part of the afternoon. So the rocks were already slick, but after that, even more so. Um, coming coming down for the 50 miler at Mount Cabot, super steep, uh, super wet and really, really tricky. I must have fallen like seven or eight times, mostly in the mud, so um, didn't get injured or anything like that. Um, although I did also bump into some logs, got a pretty gnarly bruise. Um, I don't know if you can see, um, and a lot of scrapes and stuff. So yeah, I mean, it was a pretty, pretty awesome experience. It was really different from a lot of the races I've done insofar as um, there really weren't many aid stations and you couldn't have crews or anything like that so the aid stations were really basic there were two um, on the way out for the 50 mile and then a third spot where they had some water on top of um, Mount I think it's Wombeck um, and then the same two coming back but they were pretty oh and there, there's a aid station at the turnaround but they're pretty basic the turnaround had some coke but 
Um, otherwise, aid stations just had water and Fig Newtons and stuff like that. Um, that was different for me. I'm used to heavily relying on the aid stations for ginger ale and uh, little cups of Coke. That's kind of like my game plan for most ultras. So this one I had, had to actually eat the stuff that I was carrying in my pack and that was definitely a different experience. Um, I went into this, well I actually didn't plan for it at all. Um, ever since Eastern States I haven't really been feeling the same. You know I've been recovering and I've been able to run but I've noticed it takes me longer to recover from my usual runs and just definitely not feeling as fast or as strong. Um, but last Wednesday I suddenly had a run where I felt pretty good and I thought oh maybe I can do a race this weekend and I wanted to do uh, Rock in the Knob in Pennsylvania but it was just too far of a drive it's like a nine-hour drive each way um, and just with my schedule I couldn't really make that happen um, but I managed to find my husband managed to find this race this Kilkenny Ridge race that is just a couple hours away so I literally signed up for this on Thursday right before the registration closed and the race was on Saturday at 5 a.m. So um, I didn't plan for it at all. I wasn't, I wasn't sure how that was gonna be. Um, not mentally having to prepare, but also not having planned out my week in a way where I was uh, tapering or whatever you wanna call it so that I was ready for such a long race. And I kinda just decided to go for it, more for the experience than anything else, you know, get out of my comfort zone and honestly to just check out some of those trails because I figured otherwise I probably wouldn't do that. Um, so I'd say it was kind of a mixed result. I mean, for the, for the first, uh, few hours I didn't feel that great and I was thinking oh man I signed up for a whole day of this you know it started in the dark of course and it was muddy and sloppy and um, also the trail wasn't marked I guess there were some issues in the past with people changing the markings and so you're supposed to just follow the Kilkenny Ridge trail um, signs but actually the signs say other things and I couldn't really figure out a lot of the time um, what I was supposed to do so I kept waiting for the next person back who was the next woman um, this awesome very helpful person uh, Brianna Bree Russell so she kept helping me because she's familiar with the trails and she know, knew where to go. Um, thank you, Bree. That was really nice of you. Um, but yeah, for the first few hours, I was kind of feeling like, oh man, I don't even know if I'm going to want to finish, you know, but I just decided to wait it out. And I did at some point get into a groove and especially when I got into more runnable parts of the course, I think I was able to get into my rhythm and started kind of enjoying the day out there on the trails and had a great time. Um, I ended up coming in third overall. There were a few guys that I hiked Mount Cabot with coming on the way back. Um, I think it was like Caleb, uh, Larson, and Travis. Um, that was really fun having having company for that long, long climb. Um, and it was it was really great being with people. I had been with Bree for maybe the first 15 miles or so. We were pretty close to each other. Um, so that was that was kind of different for me having another woman to to run with, and then um, having friends for a good portion of the last part of the race was great. I decided to try to go for the women's record. I had kind of a general idea what it was. And so with about um, eight miles or so to go, especially, I think the last big climb was done and I wanted to try to go for it. I ended up missing it by three seconds, which is kind of hilarious. Um, I hadn't realized it would be that close, honestly, because I did the first half of the race in like six hours and 15 minutes. So I was hoping to come in like under 13 or early 13s, but I think I think, I think it's partially that the descent um, from Mount Cabot down to the in the last part of the race is is tougher to navigate than the descent in the opposite direction. Like you could pretty, pretty easily run those last few miles down to the turnaround, to the halfway point, um, but it's not the same for coming down Mount Cabot. But anyways, um, I did really reel it in, but the conditions were tough and um, in some ways it was a bit of a tough day for me. So I'm not that bummed about the three second thing, I think it's kind of kind of funny and hopefully I can get back out there another year and uh, and crush my time from this year um, but yeah it was a great day it was run by uh, put on by Rock Hopper Races and Christina Fulchik was one of the RDs everyone was super super friendly and it was this beautiful start and finish to the race where they had tiki torches lining the beach which was like the first hundred meters maybe before you go into the woods um, and it was just really fun to hang out with everyone after have this evening on the beach I won this amazing little cook stove where you put um, sticks into it and you can cook with it. So that was like a really cool prize. Um, and there's food, nice nice people, and it was just a, a really great experience. So I definitely recommend checking out their other races. And um, if you can't, definitely recommend checking out those gnarly trails because man, I've been, well, yesterday was the first day I could really walk. Um, I was definitely more sore after this than from Eastern States even. So. Um, the first 
a couple days after this race, I could I could barely walk. So I think that's a good sign. I think that means I uh, successfully pushed myself with this. So um, happy trails, everyone. Take care, and definitely recommend checking out Rock Hopper races and um, checking out these trails in the whites, man. Woo! And with an impressive overall win on the day, Rhode Island's Ben Quattromoni coming in on post-Eastern States legs uh, with an appreciation for the tough, toughness of the course and those out there making it possible. Uh, ben, cue us into your day at uh, Kilkenny. Hey everyone, this is Ben Quattromoni here to recap the 50 mile iteration of the Kilkenny Ridge Race that happened this past Saturday uh, up in the Northern Way Mountains of New Hampshire. Um, yeah, it was uh, kind of a last minute uh, decision to register. Um, I'm still kind of recovering from a good effort at the Eastern States, so I didn't know if the my legs were gonna be able to handle it, but uh, made it through to the finish and had a really good day out there. Um, so all in all, it was an awesome day. Uh, Kilkenny Ridge Race is a, the 50 mile version is an out and back on the Kilkenny Ridge Trail, starting in uh, Stork, New Hampshire, uh, going on south to Jefferson, turning around and going back to the finish line. Um, it was about 47 miles total, about 15 and a half thousand feet of ascent and descent. Um, yeah, it was a beautiful day. Uh, started at 5 a.m. in the dark. Um, maybe did about an hour and a half, maybe a bit more in the dark on the outbound trip. Um, it was, uh, if I, I said on my description online, if there is a list of top uh, and hardest 50 mile races in the country, I, I think this has to be at or near the top, or at least the discussion um, between all the climbs, the footing, the overgrowth, the rocks, the roots, uh, throwing a little bit of rain to make everything nice and slick and muddy. Uh, it, it was definitely an interesting day. Um, some sections were quite runnable. Uh, a lot of it was not runnable, uh, hiking. Um, but overall, it was just a great day uh, in the mountains of uh, New Hampshire. Um, day started out pretty good for me. I didn't really have any expectations going into it. Um, just trying to get out there and have a good time. But I think in the back of my head, I knew uh, what the course record was, uh, which was about 10 hours, 58 minutes from a couple years ago. So I, I think in the back of my head, I kind of had that in there. And going outbound uh, to the turnaround, I think I was just maybe just under that. Uh, and then returning back to the start, uh, uh, definitely did not negative split. Um, the climb from the turnaround back up to uh, Star Mount Star King was just absolutely brutal. Uh, I think it was like two miles, maybe less than that, and maybe like uh, 2,500 feet of climbing. So it was definitely a tough way to start the return uh, after getting down to Jefferson. But um, yeah, I had a, just a awesome day and, you know, super happy to be out there in the woods uh, on a beautiful remote uh, part of the White Mountains. Um, over the 50 mile uh, course, uh, there are zero road crossings. Uh, so you definitely feel like you're out there, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, there were two aid stations, backcountry aid stations. And uh, I just can't say enough for the volunteers who uh, hiked out there and, and spent the night. Uh, so they would be there for us when we came through pretty early in the morning. Um, it was just, uh, I, if you guys are watching this, that was awesome. And uh, you guys kept us going through the whole race. Um, but yeah, I was lucky enough to get the W uh, at the end. Um, didn't get the course record, but uh, def just at the end, I was trying to finish around 12 hours. So we got 11 hours, like I think 51 minutes or something. But I uh, definitely struggled a little bit at the end there, uh, getting to the finish. Uh, my legs are definitely... Feeling the effort and uh, maybe feeling the 100 mile effort from a couple weeks ago, but uh, definitely maybe something I would uh, do again in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much a big recap of the race. Um, I guess just to add, it's cool to go over to 4,000 footers and a couple of 3,000 footers in the span of about 23 or so miles. Um, and uh, yeah, I just especially never being in that part of uh, White Mountains. Um, it's just kind of separated from everything else that people normally do. Uh, so it was cool to see uh, a race that took place uh, out there. Um, 
it's just not a spot that you would think there would be a trail race and rock hopper races put on an awesome event and i'm just super happy that i was able to uh, partake in it and uh, hopefully we'll come back next year uh, i think that's all i had and thank you very much and hope everyone gets out there and enjoys the woods adios and lastly in the kilkenny mix we have brianna russell uh, probably has a deeper connection to the whites than most in that field uh, and racing with that foundation uh, brianna uh, cue us into uh, your history and connection to Kilkenny. Hi there, my name is Brianna Russell. This past weekend I had the opportunity to run the Kilkenny Ridge Race, which was a really fun opportunity for me because this is a race that's sort of in my own backyard. I grew up in New Hampshire and these trails mean a lot to me. Uh, I've actually been working in the White Mountains, living up here and doing trail work for the last five years in the summertime. And it was really great to get out there and see so many people just enjoying these mountains that I've called home. It's really fun for me, especially to see, you know, generation after generation coming to these places because you'll see folks out here on trails that, you know, they did with their parents as kids and now they're getting to share with their own children. And that just warms my heart every time I see it. Um, so getting to see, you know, families out there hiking while I was running this past weekend was really, really special. Um, I actually did this race several years ago in 2018. It was the inaugural Kilkenny Ridge Race, and it was my first ultra as well. I'd just gotten into trail running. So in that way it was special too, because it was kind of like coming back home to this race that it's like, ah, oh, now I can finally get a chance to do it better. And one of the things that I was reminded while I was doing this again, is just how much I love these trails. They're so unique. Uh, when you look around at trails across the country, these kind of stand out because they're really, really old. Um, some of these were actually cut close to 200 years ago, not to mention you know, the use that they saw by native peoples even before then. And back then, no one was thinking about you know, the erosion or how to make these trails sustainable. So they just go straight up, straight down. And the only thing that's keeping the, the earth in place are these jagged rocks that kind of litter the trail and kind of keep it from turning into a total mud pit which is you know it's really challenging to run on but it's also really unique um, one of the things that's fun as a trail builder is i get to see kind of here and there on the course things like these step stones that people really intentionally put in place or rock staircases going up to rogers ledge but other than that it's a pretty primitive course there's not a whole lot of you know, added structures to this trail. So you really feel like you're out there and you're really in this remote, sparsely traveled forest. And that's really fun as well. Um, something that's kind of interesting to me is that people often will dismiss our mountains out here in New Hampshire. And they just, cause they're not tall. Uh, on this race, you know, we don't get much above 4,000 feet, but the grade and the loose rocks and these big muddy pits with just a few little twigs and rocks to hop across on really make it a challenging course and some of the most challenging terrain I've ever run on. It's something that I've kind of, someone had told me years ago, but I didn't believe until I started doing races elsewhere, is that if you can run out here, you can run pretty much anywhere. Um, and something that was also really fun for me to see is how this community has evolved out here with trail running. There used to be a lot of animosity between the hikers and the trail runners out here. Um, I think that comes from the fact that if you're out on a hike and you see 50 people charging by, you don't really feel like you're in the wilderness anymore. But I think people are starting to realize that we're all out here for the same reasons. We all just want to enjoy these mountains, enjoy these trails, see the views, and have a good time with everybody. And so it was great to see some of that improve. Back in 2018, there was enough animosity that there were some folks who had, you know, actually vandalized the course, moving some of the markers, and it was really sad that a lot of racers, you know, got mixed up in the dark going down trails that they weren't supposed to go on because those flagging tapes that marked the course had been moved. Um, and we didn't have any issues with that this year. We just followed the trail signs, and I think that worked out really well um, because the hikers got to feel like they're in the wilderness and the trail runners got to, you know, stay on the course. So that was fun to sort of see that, you know, everyone that I met out there hiking 
had really positive things to say and just seemed happy to be out there with us. I started hiking out here myself over 10 years ago now. It was a way for me to just kind of escape from everything and get inside myself. And now through trail races, this isn't a way for me so much to escape, but to connect with other people. And on those long kind of lonely miles when you're just out there, you can still really get inside and get even deeper still. And that's something that I really love about being out here and doing these trail runs. So it's really been great to see the community evolve and it, it reminds me just why, why I love this area and why I keep coming back to it. Um, I really hope to be back here again sometime and I'm so happy to have had the opportunity to come back and race. Thank you. All right, then moving back a bit south to New York, uh, the Sterling Furnace, uh, a wonderful event used to raise money for the park and New York, New Jersey Trails Conference ran in Tuxedo, New York. Uh, 46 finishers in the half, John Freeman and Krista Tyler took the overall men's and women's wins with Mason Crow and Kathy Herbert over 16 uh, in the 15, over 16 in the 15K. Uh, taking us deeper into not just the event, but the amazing entity, which is the New York, New Jersey Trails Conference, which many of us very much rely on for our own running, if not events. Uh, Crux Trail supporter and finisher, Don Weiss. Hello everybody, I'm Don Weiss from the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. I'm here in Wild West Milford on the border between upstate New York and the Jersey Highlands. You'd never guess it, but West Milford, New Jersey is a real trail town with 125 miles of trails and rocky cliffs and rock caves and sky top lakes. We're also connected to tons of parkland on both sides of the state line with more than 500 miles of trails. If that sounds unbelievable for New Jersey, great. We like to fly under the radar here. So anyway, the trail conference is heavily into trail running, both races and fun runs. And with the help of our 9,000 member supporters, folks like you and me, and 2,000 volunteers, we take care of over 2,000 miles of trails from North Jersey through the Catskills and beyond. And last weekend, our board member and race director, Charlie Gaydahl, whose name may sound familiar to you, hosted the Sterling Furnace Half Marathon and 15K in Sterling Forest State Park. So in Sterling Forest, the trail conference has built this beautiful network of fun, sustainable, single track trails. Uh, the half marathon had plenty of rock and nearly 1,600 feet of vert, but because of the quality of the trails, the first finisher crossed the line in, a minute, in an hour and 43 minutes. Um, plus he was pretty fast too. And the first woman crossed in 235. So I personally had a blast running it. I was the first old guy to finish, so I was proud of that. And in fact, I think it's my favorite trail half marathon course. Um, anyway, Charlie Gaydahl also hosts, hosts the Cat's Tail Marathon, Manitou's Revenge, and he's launching the Pocantico Hills Marathon in Rockefeller State Park this November. Uh, you can find all those in on Ultra Sign Up. Um, finally, if you live in the New York or North Jersey area and are looking for Saturday group runs, um, please check out our Facebook group. It's called Trail Conference Trail Runs. Um, what we do is we get together once a month on Saturdays, uh, check out places where the trail conference has been doing great work, um, and do some 6 to 10 mile runs. We've got two pace groups, and our next run is October 9th um, in Harriman State Park. So I uh, hope to see you there, and uh, thanks so much. Bye. All right, thanks so much for all that you do, uh, Don, in so many ways. Uh, very much appreciated, and thanks for weighing in this week. Uh, Conquer the World Endurance, uh, Steve Estramera's crew uh, has put on the Pauling 24-hour running festival, 3, 6, 12, and 24-hour uh, options. Uh, they used a 1.7-mile loop in Pauling, New York. Uh, year two of the event saw event records fall with Luke uh, Cor Koronek and Jennifer Bernard, uh, top 24-hour finishers with 89 and 80 miles covered. In the 12-hour, Fran Gage and Wayne uh, Benchetta were top female and male with 48.7 and 40.3 miles covered, respectively. And in the 6-hour, Dan Marchese and Jennifer Toti. Uh, for the 3-hour, uh, Derek Eidman and Carly Giesler um, were the top uh, men's and women's finishers. And reporting in, we have a clip from top grossing uh, women's 24-hour runner Jennifer Bernard, along with third woman in length Angela Legg, with 80.64 and 73.92 miles, respectively. Uh, Jennifer and Angela, take us into uh, your experience at Pauling. Hi, Trails Collective. I'm Angela Legg, and this is Jen Bernard. 
and we just spent last weekend running the CTW 24 hour Pauling Trail Running Festival race and we're here to give you our race recap and share a little bit about our experience. Um, this was the second year that the awesome guys at CTW have put on this race. They offer four different timed um, formats. You can choose the three hour, six hour, 12 hour, or the challenge that we took on running on a looped course for 24 hours. So Jen, do you want to kick us off? Tell us a little bit about this loop that we spent 24 hours on. All right. The loop itself is a 1.68 mile loop. It's got 160 to 170 feet of elevation per loop. So it's not a flat loop. This is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and it's part trail, part blacktop. I'm not quite sure of the percentage. I would say probably maybe 60, 40, mostly trail. And the trail isn't very technical at all. It's got a lot of roots in it, but not a lot of rocks, a few rocks maybe. And the, all that elevation is in one hill towards the end of the loop. So as soon as you're done with the, the hill, you get to see your, your crew. That was one of the most amazing parts of this experience is that the way this park is set up, everybody was able to bring their um, friends, their spectators, their crew to come hang out during this kind of festival-like atmosphere. Um, we got to see everybody every 1.7 miles and that came in handy yeah. because the weather was really hot this weekend. Yeah. About um, 85 degrees. Yeah. Feel, real feel. <laughs> So, um, a little bit about our experience uh, this weekend. This was um, my second time doing a 24-hour race, and so I went into this with kind of some um, goals to try to do better than the first time that I had tested this out. And I went out pretty slow, as I think uh, a lot of people recommend in a 24-hour race. And for me, my early parts of the race was just about kind of getting into a rhythm, um, finding my pace on the pavement, finding my pattern, my footfalls on the trail, and um, not letting that hill crush me early on in the race. Uh, what about you? What was your first part like? First part wasn't that bad. It was just the heat, really. Um, I felt like I was doing great, and I thought I was fueling properly. The longest I've ever done was uh, 42 miles. I ran the OCA uh, Old Croton Aqueduct from the dam down to Bryant Park in New York City. So 42 miles was the longest I ran. So I was like, oh, um, my sea, rate, sea goal was 50 miles. And then there were other goals on top of that, but I had to throw the A goal out the window when I found out of the heat. The heat was really bad. We had ice bags <laughs> stuffed in our bras for most of the day. <laughs> um, but then night came. We had the most spectacular sunset at this race. It's beautiful. Um, yeah, we all got our waist lights and headlamps on and started um, trudging through the night, which was really great. Um, we had a couple of friends who came out to support us and help us get through those, uh, those night loops, which anyone who has done a race that goes into the the nighttime knows that those are those are rough moments in the night <laughs> and it they was. were for they were we, we was, had our struggles it was an eye-opener for me um because this was my first 24-hour race and a night race as well so this was an eye-opener there were things that my body did that i didn't realize were going to happen but what was really cool was right before the sun rose we heard coyotes mm -hmm. yep Lots they weren't birds, on the wildlife. loop <laughs> some wildlife out there but the first thing i ever experienced was the sunrise and a rally right at the end yeah so uh jen and i had pretty distinct experiences where um i really mentally struggled and and kind of was fighting the mental battle all the way to the end jen had this amazing experience where in the last couple hours she just started running she was passing everybody and uh, that's why this woman right here came in first female overall <laughs> she did awesome um i came in third so it was really good we both um we both did awesome we both battled it out <laughs> um what else do we want to say about this race um 
Well, that is open for next year. Yes, it is open for next year. This um, race is amazing. If you are experienced at time ra timed races or if you're brand new and you want to um, test where your limits might lie, yeah. the CTW Pauling Trail Running Festival, we are both already signed up. Yeah. <laughs> we would love to see you there <laughs> next year. Um, thanks for letting us share our Experience Trails Collective. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. All right, heading south. Uh, to Virginia, uh, one of the marquee 100-milers uh, uh, for sure on the East Coast, uh, Grindstone 100 with 21,424 feet of gain over 100 miles, just under, uh, comes in fifth in our ranking of toughest, north, toughest Northeast 100s. Uh, Grindstone is a beauty, uh, big ups, runnable terrain, uh, the night start, great Virginia trails and community. Uh, they saw this year 156 finishers with another 73 who either did not start or did not finish. Uh, it was a bit er pulled a bit earlier, I think, this year, uh, so there were some hotter conditions uh, to contend with. Uh, Danny um, Matheson uh, took the overall win in 20 hours, 2 minutes, with top women's spot earned by Heather Doherty in 26.13. I'm thankful for a few clips in this week. Uh, the first will be a clip coming in from a slightly different vantage point, uh, that of a highly achieving sibling who will introduce and be followed by women's winner, Heather Doherty. Hi runners, my name is Dana Doherty and I'm recording in beautiful Chicago, Illinois. I wanted to tell you about a recent achievement of mine last Saturday. I went to the pie store. Now I have to walk there. It takes me about 10 minutes. And I also had to walk back, but I made it. And you know, sometimes it's a struggle to finish an entire slice of pie and also your kids. But since I'm seven months pregnant, I did a pretty good job of eating my blueberry cheesecake and finishing my daughter's apple pie and my son's chocolate cream pie. And I consider that a really big achievement, big league achievement for the Doherty family. However, during that same time, my beautiful, talented, wonderful sister was also doing something pretty cool of her own. Uh, maybe a slightly larger achievement. My sister, Heather Doherty, recently completed and was the first female to finish the Grindstone 100 in the 2021 race. Uh, Heather Doherty, we are so proud of you. And next time you're here, I'll do my best to take you the first slice and get you a piece of pie of your own. Congratulations, I love you, and I hope to see you soon. Bye. Heather, who takes us through running out of uh, better things to do on Friday nights, uh, kicking rocks, stupid mountains, and turning that frown upside down uh, for the win. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Doherty, and I just ran the Grindstone 100 this past weekend. It was something. So. Why did I run the Grindstone 100? Well, I live in Washington, D.C., and there's only a couple that are, couple 100s that are within driving distance. And I've already done MMT. That's a great race. Who doesn't love Mass Nut Mountain? And a few years ago, my buddy, I just met him, and he was training for the Grindstone 100. And he actually gave me a bracelet one day that, you know, said Grindstone 100 on it. And he's like, one day you'll do this race. And I was like, ha, ah, no, this race starts on a Friday night. Why would I do that stupid thing? Well, it turns out five years later, I go and run it. And I somehow won the women's race. So that was pretty exciting. And um, luckily, he was there to help me crew for me the whole time. Well, not the whole time. He came in the morning, Saturday morning. So... I'll talk a little bit of just about my experience with Grindstone and also how I met my first crew member to show up for the day. So actually she drove me to the race. Her name is Felicia. So three years ago at Grindstone, so 2018, I paced my buddy from miles 50 to 80 and the other person, Rob, who I was just talking about, he ran miles 8100. So my buddy, he was having a rough time. It was Sunday morning about 7.30, the race ends at 8, I'm like, where's Todd? Where's Todd? So Todd comes in, he's in rough shape, but he finishes, go Todd, he's pretty great, and 
However, he was having a little issues, so he maybe needed to go into an arm bar. So this woman, you know, helped him out, and this woman then became our good friend. So Grindstone has a lot of history with me and my friends. So this woman, Felicia, who I met at this race three years ago, she drove me out to the race, you know, tried to get me ready. She's an ultra runner. What do you need? I'm like, I just need to get as much rest before 5.30. That was our, my start time before I can run. So we're hanging out. All right, gun goes off or whatever. We start running. It's it's an ultra. <laughs> so just, just trotting along. Doo, doo, doo. There's an elite start this year because of COVID and eight women we started together. So I introduced myself. Hey, I'm Heather, blah, blah, blah. I'm not very exciting. And everyone seemed nice. So I ran with a couple people for the first couple miles. Nothing too exciting while it was daylight. We had a couple hours of daylight. And then, so nighttime rolls in. You know, everything's going smoothly. I'm drinking my tailwind. And I really like PB&Js. So that's what I get at the aid stations mostly. Especially early on. I like solid food. I need to eat solid foods or my stomach is very upset <laughs> with me. <laughs> Heather, I'm hungry. So, that's what I'm... I ate at most of the beginning aid stations. So then the night, of course, night comes and I'm all alone for a while. And I swear, it was between miles 15 and 20, I think. There is a pot smell and it must have been campers, but there were four guys ahead of me in the race. And I caught up to them. I'm like, is that you guys smoking pot? If so, bold choice for a hundred. And they laughed and they didn't smell it. So I'm like, maybe I'm hallucinating already. Who knows? I wasn't because then later on someone else said that they smelled the pot. So then, keep going. Do, do, do. The nighttime, the worst part was we had to go up this seven mile hill, hill slash mountain. And I was all alone, like completely dark, no headlamps in front of me, behind me, but we just keep going. And I get to the next aid station and they're like, oh, you're the first female. I'm like, oh, cool. And I'm like, well, I guess let's try to keep this up. <laughs> and then I start running with this guy. It turns out he also lives in D.C. and we have a mutual friend together. And it's great. So then it's honestly the first 65 miles before sunrise was very uneventful. Everything was going according to plan. I could eat. I could drink. I... The sunrise was the most beautiful sunrise I have ever seen. It was red. You know, the light was just going through the trees and I was on top of a ridge and there were wildflowers. It was gorgeous. And I picked up my friend Veronica at mile 50. That was great. She was just in my normal run club. So we're running, do, do, do. So the, the first thing that starts to go wrong is going back down the seven mile mountain. I think it's about seven miles. My toe starts to hurt. I was like, I have something in my toe. What did I do? I had a bag packed at mile 65 North River Gap to change my clothes because I figured it would be morning and it would be nice to get new socks and new shoes and do all that kinds of stuff. So I get down to the aid station and I was like, I got a big blister on my foot and I think I have another blister on my heel and I don't normally get blisters. But this is a pretty rocky course. So we, my friends, Rob, the guy that I met in the gym, and his son, Dylan, He's now there, and my friend Veronica, who just finished with me, and Felicia. So now I have my four crew members. The fifth broke her wrist on Friday night. Sorry, Kelly. So she did not come. That's a whole different story. So I'm at North River Gap. And I'm like, it's time to change. Let's do this. So I, there's a couple people sitting in front of me, and I'm like, I'm changing right here. I'm not going any extra. So my friends get some towels out. And this wonderful stranger brings a third towel so I can have a little triangle. And she's like, just holding it up. And I'm like, I don't care who sees me naked. You can look if you want. I don't think you want to see this, though. So <laughs> I just change at the aid station behind some towels. And then my sock comes off. My big toe on my right foot, the big toenail, it's coming off. It's not black yet, but it was, it was nasty. It's red. It's gross. So I think that messed with me mentally. And then... So then I pick up my friend Felicia. She's also a Marine, so she's pretty hardcore. 
And so we run, and that's when I start getting whiny. It starts to get hot and humid, and I'm like, my toe, my toe, all these rocks, whine, whine, whine. It's grindstone. Of course they're rocks. It's Virginia. Of course there's rocks. <laughs> what was I thinking? What was I thinking? So I'm running, 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 whining, whining, whining. She's not having any of it. And then my, so I finally, she's just like, Heather, eat and drink. I'm like, okay, I luckily have a strong stomach. I can eat the whole time. So I'm eating, I'm drinking. And then I get to my friend Dylan. So he's about 25. He hasn't done any ultras. So he comes and cruise for me and paces for me because he's awesome. And <laughs> his dad drags him too, but he's great. And then I just, I hit the wall then. It's, we have to go up two big climbs with him for miles, what, 80 to 95-ish. So we're going up and I, if you can tell, I have a scar because I broke my shoulder tripping on a curb. So I don't like to fall and uh, trail running is probably not the sport then to do that. So I, I got nervous and we're going up this mountain and I literally, I thought I was going to fall off the one side of the mountain. Luckily I fell into the mountain, but that totally screwed with me mentally. And I think we had another maybe half mile, a mile up this mountain. And so I was just going super slow and I'm like, I'm losing pace. I don't know what to do. I'm nervous. Da, da, da. And then we finally get to the top of that stupid mountain, <laughs> get back down to the next, I think there was an aid station. And then we go back up to Elliot Knob. If you know Elliot Knob, you know it's just rocky. And at that point now, my toes are really bothering me. I keep kicking rocks. I'm not lifting my feet. Kicking rocks. Blah, blah, blah. Ugh, it was terrible. Yelled, ow. I dropped the F-bomb quite a bit. And poor Dylan, he's just like, Heather, you're doing great. Heather, you're awesome. He just said, you know, doing what a pacer's supposed to do. And finally we got up that stupid mountain. And we had to go down that mountain. And then we get to the last aid station. And I've been in the lead since about mile 40, 45. And I and I hadn't really seen any other female crew until now. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, I can't get past now. I don't want to be that person. Which, I mean, it's totally fine. Things happen, right? So then I take my little pouty face and I turn my frown upside down. And my buddy Rob, who uh, got me into this stupid sport, he's like, Heather, you got to go now. They're probably about two miles behind you. And then complete 180. I don't know what happened, but I was back into running mode. I was like, let's finish this stupid thing. Also, it was getting dark again. I'm like, let's just go. Go, go, go. So, ran. May have fallen at mile 98. I'm bruised a little, but it's fine. You fall. It happens. And then, cross the finish line. The end. Race is complete. Thank you. Bye. Dana and Heather, thanks so much, and congrats to both of you on your respective achievements. Uh, next up, overall third place finisher, the man who's worn many hats in the Virginia uh, running and trail scene and isn't slowing down seemingly all that much, uh, John Anderson. Uh, he'll take us into what he loves about Grindstone, what for him is proving to be his foolproof recipe for success at Grindstone, as well as 100s. Uh, so John, take us away. Hey, this is John Anderson coming to you from Crozet, Virginia. Uh, after the Grindstone 100 miler this past weekend. So yeah, Grindstone, um, gosh, it's such a tough race uh, for anyone who hasn't done it before. It's just uh, a very classic Virginia 100 miler. If you're looking to experience the best and worst of what the East Coast has, uh, you should definitely come and uh, check it out. It's got about 23,000 feet of gain and 100 miles. It's an out and back course, which I actually really love. Um, and, uh, it's just, I think the best thing about it is, uh, you just, it's kind of like a locals race. I live about 45 minutes from the course, but, uh, the aid stations are, uh, worked by basically people that you meet at all the ultras from around the state. And you're always going to be racing a really good common group of regulars. Uh, and then we have a lot of people come in from, um, out of state as well. So Clark Zealand and the EcoX crew just really put on a great um, race every year. Um, and the course is just relentless uh, climbs. And, you know, interestingly is 
as, as much elevation as there is, and there's a lot of very steep technical climbs and descents with just slippery, terrible rocks and your feet are like constantly getting bruised. Uh, but then there's, there's kind of long stretches of some Jeep road as well. So you can make up some time running between some of these um, sections here. So uh, this year, really the story was just heat and humidity. Uh, this has got to be the hottest grindstone. And the biggest thing is just the warmth of the overnight temps when you start. You start we start at 5.30 to 6 o'clock, depending on the wave start that you were in. And um, just right away in one mile, you could tell you're just pouring sweat. And uh, I think pretty quickly, everybody was running out of water before every aid station. So, uh, you know, my race strategy, this is my 900 and my 40th Ultra. Uh, as a bit of a veteran, although I still feel like a noob after eight, nine years of racing, um, was just go slow, you know, and uh, really right from the get-go, uh, a lot of people going out pretty fast, you know, not, not too fast, but um, I think I was about uh, 14th or so at mile 30, and uh, it was just hot and muggy, um, and again, just you could tell if you if you messed up at an aid station and didn't grab enough water or nutrition, you were kind of going to pay for it. And I think most people kept having to tweak what they were doing and then also really readjust their pace. There's a surprising number of drops as early as mile 22 and, and mile uh, 35. Um, so really the crux of Grindstone is uh, between North River Gap and North River Gap. So between about uh, mile 35 and 65, you start about a 3,000 foot climb and uh, you get up into the kind of the higher elevations of the race. And it's just tough. It's a tough time of night. Uh, it was really cool. We had a full moon out. So I thought that was really awesome. Um, and, uh, you know, personally me, uh, I, I thought I was being smart and was waiting for people to come back to me. But when I got to the turnaround, I was in uh, ninth place by about 20 minutes and everybody just looked good zooming past me by like two miles so i was starting to feel a little sad and uh still hadn't passed anyone uh, and then you make the 3,000 foot descent down into north river gap 2 mile 65 and uh finally that's where the carnage started so <laughs> i would say that uh that section uh and for anyone ever running grindstone between miles 35 and 65 is really just the tough part of the race to kind of get through in in one piece and as soon as i came into north river gap passed a few people um and then got fired up right so now my juices are flowing and i let myself finally break out of kind of that slog walking easy pace and actually start to race uh, a little bit and uh just about every aid station kept picking off one or two more competitors, which were also like friends. So, you know, it was good and bad to see them having a rough go of the humidity. But, uh, you know, at the same time, we had, a, we had a joke early on when we were all climbing up uh, Elliot's Knob at like mile five and a bunch of us were together and just, just kind of ribbing each other and being like, honestly, I hope you fail, right? Because the truth is like, we're all competitive. We all want to win and to some degree we know that means we got to get through some carnage and we hope you're the carnage. Uh, so that was kind of fun. And it ended up, you know, being true where a bunch of us were okay. And a bunch of us were, were part of the carnage. So, so I was happy to just not be the carnage and, um, uh, kept up with, uh, nutrition. Uh, I used, uh, Chris Roberts new drink long haul all day long. And then I just ate a bunch of real food. Uh, the aid station workers were so awesome. They, they like always served me the best grilled cheese or the perfect amount of bacon or the perfect temperature soup all day. So I was I was just really uh, feeding off of them. And then uh, I was drop bagging it early and had my wife crew me from mile 65 in, uh, joined by the infamous David Horton as well for, for several crew stops. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, just, just kind of slowed down the least and kept picking people off. Uh, so I finally moved into third place around mile, um, I guess you'd say 85, 84 or so, and actually caught second place in the second to last aid station. But uh, 
I think he was just sleeping or something because as soon as he saw me, he took off and there was just no hope of um, catching him again. So I ended up third place, had about a five minute PR and, um, and, and negative split the course, which I was most excited about, which I think in 100 mile running, it just takes a lot of patience. I'm not going to claim to be a super veteran, but uh, I think it's really, really, really hard to go out as slow as you should and stay slow until like mile 65 or 7. But I think that's like the full or the fail proof recipe for success at these things. And I was really pumped uh, to execute that. Um, and uh, yeah, so first and second place are about 30 minutes ahead, uh, Danny and Bobby. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, it was great. Uh, my got a shout out to my training partner, Danton, who finished 19th place and, um, the women's race, you know, I haven't heard a whole lot about yet. Um, but I know, uh, another local, um, Heather Darty won and then second place was Ash Walsh from Georgia and third place was, uh, um, Christina Gorman from Colorado, who, who asked me some questions before the race. And the one thing I told her was like, prepare for the heat and humidity. So, um, so anyway, that's about a wrap from Grindstone. Great race, Clark, awesome volunteers. And anyone looking for just a really, really great challenge and a hard rock qualifier should definitely plan on coming out to Virginia next September. So, uh, have a great evening. See ya. And also having a solid day out there, fourth place woman on the day, Nell Fox. Uh, Nell takes us through her first 100 experience, managing heat, cannons, crying and cussing, and the importance of crews. Um, so, um, Nell, take us in. Hi, everyone. My name is Nell Fox. I live in Bridgewater, Virginia, which is very, very, very close to the Grindstone 100 race. Um, I chose this race because originally I wanted to do Pinhoti 100, but that was a race conflict for my husband who's running the Lynchburg Ultra Series. So I settled for something nearby that I knew would be a really great challenge no matter what, which was of course the Grindstone 100. My husband has run it, I've crewed and paced for other people who've run it, so I was somewhat familiar with the course. Last year in preparation for Hellgate, I ran the Wild Oak Trail and really enjoyed that. So I decided that it was time to do 100 after Hellgate went so well. I felt like I had many miles in me. I had race magic and I felt like I had many more miles left to go. And this weekend I learned um, that you can do a race and not experience <laughs> race magic. So Grindstone 100 was this year moved up several weeks in order to avoid conflicts with hunting season. So this year it ended up being very hot. Uh, the high ended up being around 87 degrees on Saturday and it was very interesting. Um, on Friday night, the evening start was a, a 5.30 for the Elite Wave, which I was in and Basically, we started and my heart rate was just sky high, even though I was running pretty easy. It was just very hot outside and very humid. Um, so coming into mile five, five and a half at the first aid station, everyone was soaking wet as we began our ascent to the first major climb, Elliot's Knob, which ends up taking you straight up a fire road. Um, and it's, it's almost hands on knees climbing. It's pretty significant. And the sun was setting at that point and we could see our breath. Uh, usually you can only see your breath when it's cold. Uh, it was so hot and humid. You could see your breath <laughs> in that way. And my husband, when we came into Dowell's draft, which is just after 20 miles, said that he could see steam coming off of the runners that everyone looked like they were working way harder than they should be. I personally felt like I was working way harder than I should be and actually consider dropping. I'm really grateful to my friend Corey Gray who did end up dropping at North River Gap, but he kind of helped keep me working towards my goal. This is my first 100. He had done a um, 100 before and um, so he really wanted to see me finish. And so I kind of got in behind him and just 
um, powered through to Lookout Mountain. And at that point, I, I guess the temperature had dropped enough where I was starting to feel a little more comfortable and um, basically just kind of took off from there. And by that point I was in fifth place and I moved into fourth place after the ascent up to Little Bald, um, which was a 3,000 foot climb at over seven miles. It's very aggressive, very gnarly. That's the part of the Wild Oak Trail. Um, it's very intense, but it was amazing because the, probably one of my favorite parts of the race was that top portion uh, just before the turnaround because based on the timing of year and the time that I, I was reaching the turnaround, the sun was actually rising and it was a bright red sunrise and just absolutely gorgeous and breathtaking. Um, got to Briary Branch, turned around, I called Mike, my husband, to let him know I was turning around and grab some photos and pictures and selfies. Um, and I was jogging and it felt great around mile 55, maybe it was mile 57, I started experiencing some stomach issues. I tend to thrive on broth, but I think I had kind of rotted my gut out with a lot of sweets. So like Huma gel and Noon, it was just maybe too sweet and I needed a lot more broth type electrolytes. I was popping electrolyte capsules and that was helping significantly. I continued to do that throughout the race, one every hour. Um, and, and that really helped me because for a very long time after I descended into uh, North River Gap, um, I thought I looked terrible. I felt terrible, but I was told like, you look a lot better than some of the women that are out here right now. Um, look at that one over there. And I mean, people were just dropping like flies in the heat. The sun had come out. We were trying to get off the mountain as quickly as possible as the sun was rising because there was very little cloud cover. Um, and it, it turns out that third place's feet were shredded and uh, she had not moved for 30 minutes. Unfortunately, I, um, I don't believe she finished the race. Uh, I picked up my pacer and the nausea just came in full fledged and it was just taking a couple steps and putting my head down on my poles. Um, I would taken my trekking poles from mile 35 onward and I never let go of them again. Um, but it was just all about getting to look out mountain. I got there, I laid down, um, I put ice on my sports bra, I put ice under my buff on my head and I just laid there and focused on my breath, ate some grilled cheese that felt really good. Um, took some Pepto-Bismol tablets <laughs> for the for the ride and um, took off uh, with the final uh, bit of climbing before descending into Dowels, which was Mount 80. Saw my amazing crew again. I just, I can't reiterate how grateful I am for all of the volunteers and my crew especially was so efficient. I would sit down in my chair and they would just bring me everything. They'd be refilling my bottles. I wouldn't even have to think. Uh, we would do a body check, make sure chafing wasn't out of control, check for my feet. I changed shoes a few times, socks a few times, not a blister. I cannot believe it. I'm so grateful. Um, but I was struggling. I was very much struggling at mile 80, uh, mile 78, Ash Walsh, Walsh passed me. She flew by like a cannon and, um, you know, I never saw her again. And it was relatively demoralizing <laughs> at the time, but it was really great to reach out to her afterwards and talk to her about her race and how inspired I was by her performance later on. Um, you know, being a first time 100 miler, I have a lot to learn. And at this point, the only way I was going to learn more was through others experience and experiencing it myself. Um, I picked up my second pacer at mile 80 and we had Crawford Mountain Ascent and Descent, both of which are awful, totally horrible, <laughs> um, crying, um, cussing. Um, I, again, I had the most patient, encouraging crew um, with me. I about cried when I got to Dry Branch, uh, but apparently everyone was crying when they <laughs> got there, so I don't feel so bad about that now. Um, and then I full sent that final climb, is about 1,500 plus feet, to Elliot's, um, and then you basically bomb down if you have any quads, which I did not by that point, um, and then you hit single track um, and get to Falls Hollow, and from there you have about five and a half miles. 
and I had nothing left at that point, but I knew I was going to finish. Uh, after the first aid station, I never thought I would, you know, quit. I definitely on the trails was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to full send off the mountain. Uh, I'm miserable. <laughs> but, um, you know, again, my crew was so encouraging. Those final five to six miles, I picked up my husband and we just power hiked and made jokes about more climbs and more rocks. And, um, you know, I went into panic mode as we went away from, from the finish line because I had forgotten parts of the course, uh, as most people do. Um, but finally it was coming around the lake and you're turning around basically towards the finish, which is really exciting. And I saw a light in the woods and I was really afraid that fifth place, because I was fourth place at that time, was moving in. She had been moving in on me a little bit, um, uh, a little more each time that I was coming into an aid station. And so I was like, we've got to run. And so I felt like I was sprinting for my life and it was probably like a 10 minute mile, but you know, whatever. <laughs> and I finished in 28 hours and 12 minutes, which was a lot um, longer than I'd hoped. but. Um, ultimately I, like I finished and the conditions were extremely difficult. So I know the next time I go out and do a hundred, like I've done it this one time, I can do it again. Um, the, the course was so well marked. I never wondered if I was lost. Um, all of the aid station volunteers were incredible. My crew from the bottom of my heart, I'm grateful for them. They were so efficient, positive and made communication and all of me, re, uh, meeting all of my needs very easy. Um, turns out fifth grade, uh, fifth place, um, female uh, was not right behind me. My, uh, final push to Elliot's had created a 25 minute gap between the two of us. Um, so I was really grateful <laughs> for that, but, um, you know, it was a, a really stacked women's field. Uh, Heather Doherty won. She was incredible. We had a brief conversation at the very beginning. Um, thought maybe we would run together that night, and I didn't see her after like mile one and a half. But I, well, I saw her at the turnaround, sort of like as she was coming back. But it was a great course. It's a really great way to see what's going on at the, at the front if you're kind of a, a mid, middle of the packer, um, back of the packer too. It's kind of motivating to see people and. You know, do a little elbow bump or whatever. But anyway, I'm really grateful that this race was able to happen. And um, thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. I got my belt, my buckle right here and my swag here. And I am recovering great. So great uh, job, all those uh, out there at Grindstone, uh, whether it be at the RD volunteer or entrant helm. Uh, great work. Moving back north to Vermont, the Groton Forest uh, event, which we announced in results last week, uh, is a beautiful looking event in the Groton Forest in Groton, uh, in Groton Vermont. Uh, thanks to women's winner Dylan Broderick, who was able to follow up uh, this week uh, with a clip uh, regarding the Groton Forest uh, Trail Marathon. So uh, Dylan, go ahead and take it. And thanks Ian for having me talk about my experience at the Groton Forest Trail Race. So. Um, my name is Dylan and I live in Montpelier, Vermont and a couple weeks ago I did the Groton Forest Trail Race which takes place in Groton Forest which is right in central Vermont. Um, it has a 26 and a half mile option, a 15 and a half mile and then this year which was their third year doing it they also added a 10k. Um, it's put on by a couple local runners, um, a group of local runners who are ultra runners, trail runners, so um, they have a great sense of how to put on a race and what makes a race attractive to runners. Um, so doing the, the longest distance this year was my first time doing it. I had done the 15 and a half mile a couple years ago. Um, and my goal going in this year was um, to just try and have a consistent race where I felt like I was managing my pace well, um, having energy at the end to have a strong finish, um, and just trying to enjoy the day and enjoy the trails. Um, it's a really beautiful part of Vermont and fun to explore. Um, Going in, um, I kind of broke up the race into five parts. There are three peaks in the park that you summit. Um, none of them are particularly large, but um, 
I kind of thought about those three peaks that you get to the top of and then there are also for the 26 mile um, two ponds that you go around so I kind of broke the race into those five parts um, and for the longest distance there were 20 to 25 runners I think that started um, so we started before everybody else um, the other waves or the other races started a couple hours later um, so we all went out. The first peak, Big Deer, is around five or six miles. It's a short kind of out and back. Again, not a huge climb, but um, it is the, the biggest peak of the three. Um, so that comes pretty early on. Um, it's also a nice time to see where the other runners are around you. Um, at this point on my way up, um, I passed uh, five other runners on their way back down so I had a bit of a sense of where I was within the race. Um, one was a woman, the others were all men and uh, then I didn't really see anybody for a while. I saw a few people on my way back down, big deer, but otherwise pretty much running alone for a while. Um, the next uh, kind of landmark was the second peak owl's head around eight miles. Um, did that, didn't see anybody on that one. Um, it's not an out and back but Again, a pretty mild climb, but a really nice view of the top. It was a beautiful day that we had. We lucked out. Um, perfect kind of early fall day in Vermont. Cool and very clear and sunny. And um, after Alice Head, we have a nice stretch of downhill for a couple miles. Um, not technical, mostly dirt road. Been a bit of rail trail down to the lowest point on the course. Um, so I, that's kind of my favorite type of terrain and felt like I could kind of push a bit on that bit. Um, but also just stayed in control and tried to not go too crazy. Um, and after that, you're headed towards Kettle Pond, which is the first pond you go around. It's about three miles to get around it. And um, even though it's pretty flat, it's actually one of the most technical parts of the course, um, very rocky and rooty. So I had to slow down a lot on that part um, and um, just trying to manage. Um, not rolling ankles. I had actually rolled an ankle um, pretty early on, so I was being extra cautious, which um, may have actually paid off for me. Um, so got around that, felt pretty good. Still wasn't really close to anybody. I saw one man ahead of me a little bit um, on the way back from Kittle Pond, but otherwise still pretty alone. Um, and after that, you climb up a little bit, and then you have another really nice stretch of downhill uh, single track super fun very flowy um, close to the bottom of that you do, you hit the last peak little deer which is again a, a short little out and back that one is um, pretty quick to do as well saw three people coming down at that point past one other runner before I hit little deer so had moved up one spot um, and knew that some of the others were maybe within striking distance um, for the last six or seven miles um, which brings you to the last pond Osmore Pond it's a little shorter than Kettle Pond not quite as technical but um, still definitely had to dial it back a little bit and be a bit more cautious on that part um, and then the last part you make your way back up to the road um, that you started on for the last two miles um, so heading back that way um, I could see a man Ricky in front of me and then um, Bridget, the lead woman, also was up ahead and I could see her as well. So um, at this point thought maybe I could catch them. Um, was still feeling pretty good at that point and I did end up passing Ricky before we got to the road. Um, he was having cramps so I was able to kind of scoot by him. And then with about a mile and a half to go on the road, I ended up catching up with Bridget which was pretty fun. She's an amazing runner, also from Vermont. Um, I've run with her before and she's incredible. So I was a little surprised that I had caught up with her, but she had had kind of a, a rough couple of falls, so wasn't feeling her greatest at that point, um, which I felt badly about. But um, I was feeling pretty good at that point. I was happy that I had kind of stuck to my plan and I still felt strong for the last bit. So I felt like um, I still wanted to push to the end there. Um, and so I did kind of pull away from her a bit at the end and she ended up finishing maybe a minute or less behind me. But I was pretty happy that I was able to um, still feel good at the end there and um, really push all the way to the finish. Um, 
and the finish itself is great. Um, you're back where you started at uh, Boulder Beach, which is right on one of the lakes within Groton State Forest, and it's fantastic. You're back on the beach, you um, go for a swim, there's food, there was a band, um, and from the beach you can also look back and see the three peaks that you went up during the race. So um, it's a pretty nice atmosphere to hang out and relax at the end. Um, and yeah, I think it's a really great event. Um, again, it's only in its third year, but it's it's really well done, I think. Um, the, the courses are designed in a way that um, you get a lot of variety and you're never on one surface uh, for too long. So you get some technical stuff, you get really nice flowy single track, you get um, some rail trail and dirt road. Um, and it also keeps you um, kind of distracted and not really locked into any one pace because you're having to constantly um, adjust to whatever type of terrain you're on. So it goes by really fast. It's super fun. It's beautiful. Um, I would highly recommend people come check it out. All right, Dylan, thanks so much for that clip. And on the national scene, one that uh, catches some attention, uh, if not international scene, uh, the Barkley Fall Classic, a 50K or give or take 10 miles. Uh, ran in the rugged, brushy mountains of Frozen Head State Park, Tennessee. Uh, an intro to the larger uh, Barkley Marathons. The course is complete with rough terrain, a ton of vert, minimal markings, and all that's needed to uh, sow doubt in the seeds of all those who uh, choose to enter. Uh, with an overall course record of 737, it'll do just that. So here to bring us deeper into the Barkley Fall Classic is uh, runner out of PA and finisher Sergey uh, Chepshev. Hi, Trail Collective! Uh, this past uh, Saturday I participated in the Barkley Fall Classic uh, 2021 edition uh, that took place in the Frozen Head uh, State Park near Warburg, Tennessee. The Frozen Head State Park consists of uh, 24,000 acres of wilderness uh, deep in the remote Cumberland Mountains. The park uh, gets its name from the mountain peak uh, that is uh, 3,324 feet high and uh, it's often uh, covered with ice and snow throughout the winter. Uh, it is also home for, uh, for the famous Barkley Marathon, uh, a hardest race in the world and a place where dreams uh, go to die. This year I arrived earlier and was able to take a self-guided tour at the Brushy Mountain State Penitentiary with my uh, buddy Boris Kretny. Cheers, Boris! The grounds uh, uh, of the prison are included in part of the Barclay Marathons and uh, BFC. I explored uh, cell blocks, the cafeteria, uh, prisoners' uh, paintings, which were kind of creative, and other attractions, including collections of confiscated knives and a leather made by uh, James Earl Ray from uh, branch uh, pipes uh, to climb over the wall. The Barkley Fall Classic is designed in a way to give you a taste of Barkley Marathon. The course map is uh, revealed uh, on the packet pickup a day prior to the race and you should uh, go through it multiple times as the trails uh, have only a few errors on the critical turns without traditional uh, blazers. This was uh, uh, BFC number 8 uh, beginning from 2014 and number 2 for me. In 2019, I ended up with a soldier's plate, finishing a marathon, which took me about 12 hours. I could not run it in 2020 due to COVID-19, since the race was limited only to a handful of veterans, runners who finished BFC 50K in the past. So uh, I had to wait for another year for redemption to complete uh, the whole scene. Here is some cool uh, stat about BFC this year. The race went uh, really well for me, uh, despite uh, I lost my jaws, uh, buff, sunglasses and my headphones died because of the rain. I avoided uh, leeches attached on the water crossing, uh, chiggers and uh, tick bites. Uh, this dude, uh, however, might uh, got some though. Uh, I did not get uh, stunned by bees uh, and was uh, happy not to meet uh, rattlesnakes and copperheads uh, face to face. However, I got uh, poison ivy bites. Uh, the torrential downpour during the race felt really nice and kept me cool. 
no typical steam bass uh, this year which would uh, make uh, things uh, much tougher the testicle spectacle was epic and uh, turned uh, in the mud slide uh, it was a really good experience climbing twice uh, through the briars on red jaw in the rain uh, i got multiple scratches uh, but uh, didn't uh, look as cool as uh, this guy uh, bfc is uh, running uh, with a purpose with uh, tons of fun loves uh, comrade misery despair sweat mud and blood barkley vibes Woo! Once soreness goes away, I'd better start uh, training for the next year already, uh, which, include, uh, which increases your chances but uh, doesn't guarantee you uh, a finish uh, of either a marathon or a 50k. I'd like to thank all volunteers, especially kids from the cold boy football team who refilled water bottles uh, in the pouring rain the whole day. Rangers, Les and... Uh, Big shout outs and congrats to all runners who towed the trails, no matter what was the outcome. So, I highly, highly recommend you uh, to go through the BFC Facebook page for more stories uh, and uh, reports. Uh, my next race is just like tonight in Philadelphia with Visahican Wanderers uh, Fall Trail Series. I hope it's not gonna be cancelled because of the rain, which started already, and my like bigger race in. Uh, and uh, just next week, uh, Cat's Tail Marathon in upstate New York. Trails and George, run whole, more trails ahead. So nice work, Sergey, and thanks uh, again for another clip uh, this round. All right, uh, so for upcoming events, uh, we've got a handful here. It's going to be a busy weekend ahead. On uh, one of them, I am going to take us out uh, this episode with a, a clip at the end, which uh, falls under maybe the media category as well. Uh, but here we go. Here's what we got coming this weekend. Connecticut, eight hours of the brewery, four hour, eight hour running in Norbrook Farm Brewery in Colebrook, Connecticut. Pemberton, 24 in Salisbury, Maryland, heading in with 196 solo entrants strong. Uh, Maria Miller may be looking for redemption after Virgil Crest, maybe going for the win. Uh, New Jersey, way on to wonderful 50K, 50 mile 100 in Hewitt, New Jersey. Uh, New York, the Morgan Hill Meat Grinder, half marathon and 50 mile in Fabius, New York. Rock the Ridge, 50 mile in New Paltz, New York. Uh, runnable gym which uses the beautiful carriage roads in the Shawangunk Mountains uh, and the Great Shunamunk Traverse 42k in Mountainville, New York. Uh, Virginia Yeti 100 in Abington uh, heading into race weekend with 312 entrants and a US ultra sign up projected wind time of 15.06 for the men and 19.12 for the women not a slow course. The Nasty 9 trail run 4 and 9 miler in Lexington in Vermont the Vermont 50 uh, 50k and 50 mile in Brownsville Headed in with 257 in the 50 mile and 197 in the 50K. Solid numbers there. West Virginia, the big Schloss, 50K in Lost City, Lost City, uh, West Virginia, under the uh, VHTRC, uh, Virginia Happy Trails header. Uh, win for the name with the big Schloss. And then in PA, uh, we have a handful. Uh, Water Gap 25K, 50K in Milford, PA, one that's under uh, my banner, the Red Newt uh, Racing. Uh, it's transitioning to a friend, uh, Vinny Capadora, uh, to happily running, as I'm really just usually too uh, just scorched by the time I get to the end of September to have the energy to uh, really do it well. Uh, so Vinny will hopefully take over those reins and grow it nicely. Uh, the Tails for Trails 40 Mile in Hanover, PA, used to benefit an animal rescue. The Iron Masters Challenge at 50K in Gardner's, PA. The World's End Fall Classic Half Marathon in Forksville, PA. Uh, they're heading into race weekend with 293 entrants in a beautiful course. And then one other, a classic and rugged event, uh, also in the Trails Collective uh, ranking of toughest Northeast uh, trail races, a cult classic, their 26th edition about to run, 179 entrants uh, registered uh, for this gym, uh, the Conestoga Trail Run. And so this is one uh, Jason and the crew got out a uh, media clip, which came across my Facebook feed or profile. Uh, which I am going to close out this uh, week's episode with. Uh, so thanks again to all of those who are tuning in, who take the time to like this station, uh, who support us in any number of ways. We really appreciate it. All right, so until next week, I will take you out with the uh, Conestoga Trail Run and uh, this clip. All right, for me, until then, see ya! It's the fucking Catalina wine mixer. <laughs> <laughs>
It's the fucking Catalina wine mixer. The fucking Catalina wine mixer, bro. Yes. Go. The fucking Catalina wine mixer. Fucking Catalina wine mixer. It's the fucking Catalina wine mixer. The fucking Catalina wine mixer.